Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot, known locally as a February room, is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite developments, fly rods, and fishing accessories. Tech. Precision. Ingenuity. Legacy. Go to cdfishing.us and follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Here's your host, Lauren Carnop, and this is The February Room. Welcome to the February Room. Today, my guest is Brian O'Keefe. Brian, thank you so much for joining me today, all the way from Mesa, Oregon. Thank you very much, Lauren. And I was, as I was saying, you have a huge title. You work for a full time for 11 Angling, but you're also a fishing bum with a camera. And I have to say, I was telling Justin, um, my husband, I was super excited to chat with you today. And he goes, oh, Brian, he goes, everybody in the fishing industry who goes to trade shows looks for Brian to chat and have a beer and hear his fishing stories. So I'm excited to hear one today. Oh, my goodness. You throw me right into the fire. Um, Okay. Okay, this goes way back, and Justin could appreciate this because he grew up in Bend, and I moved to Bend in 1975 and was there probably over 45 years before I just recently moved out. But uh, in my late 20s, I was a fly fishing guide on the Deschutes, and as many people know, you can wade fish the Deschutes, but you cannot fish from a floating device, so you can't fish from your drift boat. You use it for transportation only. So, you know, I took a booking from a gentleman who was a photographer for National Geographic. And he was doing a story on the East Cascades and something beyond that, but who knows. Um, So he shows up at the boat ramp. I shuttled my truck. I had the boat ready to go. And he put in three, like, large Pelican cases of cameras and lenses and sound and lights and I thought, geez, you know, this is a new drift boat. It costs quite a bit, but each one of those cases of cameras, of Nikons, cost way more than my boat. Way more than my boat. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a budding, you know, young photographer in my 20s. I'd sold a few fly fishing magazine cover shots, and, you know, I was really, really enjoying pairing photography with fly fishing in this kind of, you know, interesting, fun, young guy's lifestyle. And uh, so we shove off, and he's a decent fly angler, and it sort of appeared that he was more interested in the fishing than the photography, with, because it was the salmon fly hatch, and it was really good. <laughs> and, and like I mentioned, it was a brand new Lavro drift boat, and it came from the factory with a round anchor, like a giant cannonball. And I thought that was very odd, because they can roll. You know, they don't really like lock into the gravel, lock into the sand, or wedge in with the rocks. It just sort of rolls around. I thought, hmm, I'll have to change this as soon as possible. Well, we're fishing along, and he is shooting a few shots, and fishing's very good. And this was probably back in 1977, and, you know, there was a few boats on the river, but not like there is today. It was just incredibly good fishing. And, you know, he'd ask some questions, and we'd, I'd tell him a little bit about, you know, the locale and some of the geology and that there was the Indian reservation on the west side and different ranches on the east side and we were all just having a good time we stopped on an island I anchored the boat and we walked across the island to a riffle on the other side and we're fishing along and he looks down river and he goes is that our boat oh no that (laughs) that round anchor had just rolled downhill until it was waterborne, and away the boat goes with three Pelican cases of, who knows, $75,000 worth of camera gear. And there goes my boat. And we know the Deschutes is, you know, was named by the French fur traders as Deschutes, the rapids. So the river of many rapids, and there goes the boat. So I'm on an island, and I just tell him, okay, here's the deal. I have to swim to shore. And there's a decent trail. I'm going to run and I'm going to try to catch up with the boat. There will be another boat coming along pretty soon uh, and just flag him down and just say, hey, uh, the boat got away. Could I get a ride? You know, and he goes, okay. And 
I kind of went back to fishing and I cinched up my wader belt and dove in and swam. And of course, my wader is just completely filled up full of water. But I got to shore eventually. And thank goodness I was a lifeguard in my younger days. And uh, I basically had to do a headstand to drain the water out. And then I started running in soggy waders, all my gear. And I go a long ways. I go at least a mile before I see the boat that eddied out in a big back eddy. And the, and the anchor snagged on a little something, this stupid anchor. And I then swam out to it and got in, which was really hard, actually. When your water waders are full of water, you're trying to pull yourself into a very tall sided drift boat. Well, anyway, I get in, row it to shore, and I wait. And sure enough, here comes a, a green wooden drift boat with the guy in the front. And, you know, all his cameras were safe. Everything's okay. It's just extremely embarrassing. And, you know, you're thinking, you know, this could be a kind of a nice <laughs> career move working with a guy from National Geographic. You never know. And so, he comes in and he gets a little closer and I noticed that the person giving him a ride had two really big, very friendly golden retrievers. And they're all over this guy and he's, I can tell he's a little, little bit annoyed, but he gets out, you know, everything's good. He gets back in the boat and he goes, you know, that was really a close call, the cameras and all that, but you know, I just hate dogs. I've had some really bad experiences with dogs. That was, that was really a, terrible rescue i mean well sorry about that but you know but we're here everything's good so we continued fishing that day it went quite well he took some pictures of some corrals and some things along the side of the river a little bit of the fishing itself and we finally get to the boat ramp and my shuttle driver and i can't remember exactly how this happened this was 40 some years ago i think and uh well actually probably 50 but anyway uh we were locked out of my truck. And now he has got to get back to the put-in no. because he's driving to a, a Central Oregon resort. It was called Kanita. You, you might know it, but it's closed now. And he had to get there at a certain time and all that. And I said, well, I don't have a spare key on me and we're locked out. And I'm thinking, well, you know, hey, we're here at the boat ramp and there'll be other people coming and going, doing shuttles for tomorrow and different things. So I don't think it'll take too long for someone to come by if I can't get in my truck. And he's rolling his eyes and, geez, what a rookie guy, you know. And so eventually a boat pulls in and, and I go up to the guy and I say, hey, can you give this guy a ride back to Warm Springs <laughs> if you're going that way? He goes, oh, yeah, I'm going right through. I'll give him a ride. It was the guy with the two golden retrievers. So my National Geographic photographer jumped in his truck with the two dogs and is giving me a look like I hate you so much and I and I had to break a window to get into my truck because I learned that my keys were inside <laughs> somehow I don't know how that all happened but anyway that was a interesting day on the river so did you see the guy back at Warm Springs was he pissed no, he got a. I never heard back from him. He he got a ride to his car. He drove on. He was on an assignment for a, a month or two, and so he just went about his way. But you know, I, I'm sure uh, a year or two later, he enjoyed telling that stories at cocktail parties. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, yeah, that was my big National Geographic opportunity down the drain. Oh, but you've had quite the amazing career as an outdoor photographer. And I know that in your biography, it says that you published your first uh, photo at age 16. So what inspired this passion? Oh, yeah, I, I know. I, I actually think that's pretty cool. I, uh, well, here's the full story. Well, lived with my mother and brother in Bellevue, Washington, when it was a, a tiny little, you know, middle-class town. Now it's a giant suburb of Seattle and it's just hideous. But <laughs> um, I was, I was bike riding distance to Lake Washington. And at the time there was really good bass fishing and maybe there still is in Lake Washington. And so I'd ride my bike down there and fish. And like a lot of kids, um, maybe third or fourth grade. You know, I did my fair share of fibbing and 
trying to get out of trouble by you know telling a lie or two. I learned later that that never works, but you give it a try when you're a kid. And um, I think my brother and mother had a real sense that I had possibly a problem with honesty or the truth. <laughs> Maybe I was fibbing a lot because I came back from these little bike trips with stories of big bass and lots of bass, but I didn't, I, I only kept a fish now and then because it's kind of hard to ride. A, if you remember, I don't know, you're too young, but the Stingray bike had these weird handlebars. It's just hard to bring a bass home. So at Christmas, I got the first point and shoot camera ever made, the Kodak Instamatic. And everybody had them back in the day. They were just this little square box and had a cartridge of film and you shot your pictures and then you'd you know, take them and get prints made. So, but Christmas is in December and the bass fishing doesn't really get going till mid to late April. So my little camera just sat in my sock drawer for a long time and you know, no one really forgot about it. It just wasn't used, but you know, by the time bass fishing started, I put it in my little canvas creel with my fly box of poppers or I fished a spinning rod and stuff too back then. So I, you know, put it in with my gear and sure enough, I started catching some bass. I lay them down in you know, the typical <laughs> pitcher, especially a kid pitcher, put it down on the gravel or the sandbar and lay your rod next to it and take a picture and then push it back in the water. Well, eventually I uh, used up that cartridge of film and I announced to everybody probably by late June that I needed to get my film developed. And my, I remember my brother said, well, what have you been taking pictures of? <laughs> I said, bass. He goes, oh, come on. I mean, have, have you been taking pictures of basketball or anything else? I go, no, just, just bass. <laughs> I went, all right. So we took the film down to a place. It was called Photomat. And it was a 24-hour film deal. That was real high tech back in the totally. day. Totally. Yeah, wow. It was a cool <laughs> deal. And then, you know, we went back the next day with get this envelope and I would show my mom. She'd show it to my brother, bass, 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 bass. And they were just amazed. And, you know, I think they were amazed that maybe I wasn't fibbing. And also the bass were pretty big and slightly impressive. But I remember they would get those pictures out when people came over and they'd say, look at the bass Brian's been catching. And, you know, I didn't realize until I was probably in my forties that that was a very significant moment in my life because my brother was a pretty amazing guy. You know, he was an incredible student and, you know, he went to dental school, all these awards, you know, he was a good athlete. When I followed him through elementary and junior high, I just remember meeting my teacher, and they go, oh, you're John O'Keefe's brother. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's my brother, John. You know, he was like a hero to me. He was a great guy and, you know, good at everything. And and then about three weeks into the school, I could just see how the teachers were so unimpressed with me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I lived in the shadow of my big brother, which I think a lot of little brothers do. You know, that, that was cool. I had my role as the pain in the butt, you know, annoying little brother. And he was the sophisticated, intelligent, athletic guy. And and so I think when when they both were bragging about my bass pictures from that silly little camera, that it probably gave me like a little bit of an ego boost of like, wow, look at that. I did something my brother can't do. And uh, so I, I imagine that that's part of the reason I became sort of infatuated with photography and fish pictures and fly fishing photos and well one thing leads to another and you know I actually after I graduated from high school I had a plan to go to New Zealand and fly fish and follow my grandparents footsteps who went to New Zealand to fly fish in 1951 if you can imagine what that was like <sighs> and so um and then I was going to come back go to Oregon State and do all that well my trip to New Zealand you know went uh ahead like planned. I left when I was 19, but my three months and coming back to Oregon State didn't quite happen. I spent 11 months in New Zealand and then I went to Western Australia to work in the outback. And then one thing leads to another. I ended up as a ski instructor, the first ski instructor in, in India. And I taught skiing in Kashmir, India before coming home, but went to Alaska and then went to Oregon State. So a long, long, long story. But that little camera went with me to New Zealand 
And uh, as I would send my film home, my mother uh, would have them developed. And I remember her saying in a letter, your pictures are very professional. Maybe I should try to get you a, a better camera. And so she went into my little bank account, took out a hundred bucks and bought me a, a Minolta SR1, a very simple manual, but you know, 35 millimeter camera. And fortunately I bought slide film, which became you know, more important if I ever wanted to publish as opposed to print film. So I upgraded that camera, took it all over the place, and then bought another $100 camera, a Pentex K1000. And and I was just a total hobbyist. You know, it was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. And then one day, and now we go, come all the way back to Bend, Oregon in 1975, I was going uh, to Central Oregon Community College and Don Roberts walked in. Don Roberts is a, a published author and he was he was editor of Fly Fishing the West magazine at the time. And I recognized him and we talked and, and I said, you know, I'm, I've been doing a little bit of photography and stuff. And he goes, well, you know, bring some slides down. And I'll stop in tomorrow and uh, I'll look at him. I said, wow, that's great. You know, just a super nice guy and uh, one of the most interesting people I've ever met. And so I brought in those slide pages, you know, where there's 20 slides per page. And I taped them up to the window. And when he came in, he looked at him and he said, well, can I take a few of these back to the office? I said, well, yeah, sure. And from that, I kind of rekindled the possibility of publishing photos, even though that first one when I was a teenager was to a local uh, newsprint um, publication called Fishing and Hunting News. And just about everybody I know that's my age got their start with Fishing and Hunting News because you would just send them pictures <laughs> that use everyone. And you could see your little photo by Brian O'Keefe and go, wow, cool. And uh, but Don used a couple of those shots as covers. And then I just sort of took it a little more seriously and upgraded my equipment. And still to this day, I never call it a career because a career is, you know, you make money and you have a business card. And I've just always kept it as a hobby out of control <laughs> and a, a great companion activity to fly fishing and to travel. And and it's just opened a lot of doors for me and given me a ton of opportunities to go some really cool places, meet great people and fish, just the best of the best, you know, Kamchatka and Brazil and all over the place. So wow. there you have it. How it all started from from being a fibbing fourth <laughs> year to a world traveler, and uh, well, yeah. You know. I mean, I have to say though, I mean, is your brother like, wow, you you took the route that was probably not standard from going to school, and you probably have lived so much more in terms of like traveling all these places and doing what you love to do. Yeah, and you know, I. And my brother has lots of interests and he's still doing a lot of skiing. He's a good angler. Uh, he's got a helicopter. And he's, got, you know, <laughs> he's doing okay. Yeah, float planes. He's got a fighter jet. He's got totally amazing interests, hobbies, friend network, great life, good family. I've been more of the bum, you know, uh, <laughs> bumming around, sleeping on couches. and uh, But I, I suppose, I mean, I'm really not. I, you know, my brother's awesome, but I don't really envy that. Yeah. No. Well, because he, he does his thing. He loves it. But I, I can't complain. I took a path less traveled, but, um, you know, I don't have the giant savings and all that. But memories, experience, uh, pretty rich in that department. I just say I have to giggle about laughing about you taking this small camera and taking photographs and people like to, you know, you said that your family loved looking at those photos. And I can only think about how you've seen such a huge change with social media that now people can take photos anytime and um, they can docker up those photos. Cause I also saw in your bio that you're a naturalist. Like you like to take things naturally um, you don't bring a tripod with you. It's not staged. It's really what it is. Um, why is that so important for you to uh, take photos and to live that way? Well, it's easy to answer your question about why I wouldn't use a tripod or, you know, have a lot of lighting equipment and that sort of thing. Basically, it's just because I, I like to fish too much. And so there was one point in time when I bought a very nice video camera. It's like the one 
you know, back in the day where you'd see outside a courtroom, they all had their cameras up on their shoulders. It was that style of camera. Big, big, you've seen them all. You've, you're in this. Yes. So it was a production quality Sony camera. It cost a lot of money. And then I started, you know, taking it out with me. And I thought, oh man, this thing sucks. It's, it work. <laughs> you not only have to lug around all this stuff, then you have to do all this editing and, <laughs> and so I went immediately right back to still cameras because I have a fly rod, maybe a day pack at the most, but generally just a camera around my neck or even a small camera. I've done a lot with, well, not to these days, it's, it's my iPhone, but it's, uh, I've used the Olympus Tough, those little square underwater cameras, really tough, durable cameras. I've used those. Their macro feature is completely professional. And, um, uh, yeah, so I don't take a lot of gear. If I take a Pelican case, it's generally the small one with a, you know, like my body and a wide angle and then a 200 telephoto. And that's about it. I, I keep it really simple. And uh, in my earlier days, um, I, I really lucked out. I met a guy named Duncan Barnes. He was editor of Field and Stream magazine. And we kind of hit it off. We were just good guys. He could pick tons of photographers to go on trips with him who were million times better and more experienced than I was, but we just kind of were good buddies. And so I, uh, I really learned from an old pro about the difference between editorial, editorial photography, fine art photography, and commercial photography. Those are the three categories I've kind of, you know, pigeonholed everything into. So editorial photography is what you see is what you get. You don't give the guide a shirt from XYZ brand and you don't, you know, change things up to look good, like a photo shoot. You just shoot what you get, and that's real day in the life stuff. That's always what's sort of been my MO. I, I like day in the life. What you see is what you get. Um, commercial photography, of course, you know, boom, go to Photoshop and add a catamaran in the background and put in a sunset. I mean, anything's legitimate and commercial photography because you're trying to sell something, make it look good. Uh, fine art photography, I just never had the equipment really to do great uh, images, uh, you know, in Jackson Hole or in Alaska or somewhere where you're going to end up with a 24 to 30 inch enlargement. I just never had the money to buy that kind of glass and those kinds of cameras. But, um, and it's just sort of, I, I don't want to make this sound weird, but it's just sort of boring to me. I, I don't want to just uh, wait for the sun to hit the peak of Grand Teton all morning and get one shot. I just want to go fishing. And then, <laughs> I, you know, I see a cool bug. Hey, that's neat. Or, or a nice weird weather phenomenon of crazy clouds or just interesting light. And of course, fish above water, underwater, people fishing. I just like all parts of that. So I'm more of an editorial style photographer and self-taught. I still don't think I'm very good. I don't know how cameras work. And I just believe in going to pretty places and holding your camera still. And, um, and maybe be a little bit artistic. You know, my mother was an art teacher at the University of Washington. And so as a kid, I just got drugged to every art show and museum and art gallery. And, um, and actually, I sort of started to like it. I looked forward to going to museums and different places for that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure some of that sunk in, just composition and color, texture, different form and that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it was sort of a, a path maybe I was destined to take, even if it was subliminal. But uh, it all sort of came together. I mean, I'm, I'm 66 now, and I really think, Geez, if I had got an incurable disease tomorrow, I'd just go, oh, well. Hey, yeah. I've done a hundred times more than I ever thought I would when I was catching bass in Lake Washington. I mean, I just dreamed of places like British Columbia, which was just across the border. I just dreamed of, you know, you know maybe going to the Rockies a few times, even though my grandparents are from your town of Missoula. So I would go wow. fish with my grandfather. Actually, my grandmother was a, a fly angler also. She had her hip boots and her bamboo rod. <laughs> my granddad had his hip boots and his creel and his bamboo rod. And uh, 
you know, they were both born in the late 1800s, so that sort of freaks out young people like 1800s. I mean, that's like cowboys and Indians, like, well, almost, you know, <laughs> kind of, but not too long. You know, Civil War, 1860s, you know, so yeah, they, they grew up <laughs> as just diehard, purest, dry fly fishing people in Missoula, although he bounced around a little bit. He was with the Forest Service, so he was forest superintendent of your backyard, National Forest, the Bitterroot Lolo National Forest. So he was the head yeah. man there. And then he was uh, the supervisor of Shasta National Forest, and he was on the Kaibab National Forest down by the Grand Canyon. So he had totally great opportunities for fishing and hunting, and he took his passion for fly fishing to all those places with equipment that today we would look at as unbelievably crude I mean, have you even heard of a, what a gut leader is? It's made from cat intestine, and you have to, <laughs> you have to keep them wet all the time. As soon as they dry out, they get brittle. So you get a cat gut leader, keep it wet, and then you'd fish. What? You would even fish for steelhead on the Klamath River with a cat gut leader and a silk line and a bamboo rod. And when a fish struck, you actually gave it slack. You gave it less tension so you wouldn't break your leader and slowly applied pressure and, and it was just a whole wild and crazy world and i remember when you know our monofilament leaders were just horrible i won't mention any brand names but geez they were awful <laughs> and uh, you know you fished three flies in montana in the 60s a joe's hopper a gray wolf my grandfather would only fish dries, so I didn't have nymphs, and there weren't that many streamers in the West. They were there were streamers back east, but we hadn't got into woolly burgers yet. So it was just cool uh, being a kid learning fly fishing the English way, which is not much wading, casting upstream, fishing to rising fish only, and that's fly fishing. And now. As I got a little older and I started reading magazines and books, I, I discovered nymphs. And I could never tell my grandfather. And then I had, you know, a spinning rod or two and couldn't tell my grandfather. <laughs> and then I went, uh, you know, when, when we went to the Madison River when I was, oh, I don't know, I was probably 14 or 15. And back then, if you can imagine this, in the tackle shops and in the stores, they sold live sculpins. So you could what? you could take your spinning rod out and put a hook in a live sculpin and cast it out and it was every cast a big brown. <laughs> now all the big browns are on the walls of the bars in the Madison Valley and, and and but I was so impressed with these spin fishermen catching these huge fish that once I sort of dis, you know discovered streamer fishing. And back then, it could be just a muddler underwater. Then the spudler came along, which was a muddler with a marabou, like a sort of a woolly, woolly bugger marabou in the back and a muddler up front. And then streamer fishing became you know, pretty cool to me because I started catching big fish. And uh, But I could never do that around my grandfather. Once I got my driver's <laughs> license, I could go see him and then branch out. And I started fishing uh, like the beaver head. Oh, my God. Talk about big fish, no people. It was a middle of nowhere. and uh, But your backyard, um, Big Blackfoot River, is where we went as a family for 10 days to two weeks every summer, set up camp. It was, it was, again, just all dry fly fishing. You could have a 30 or 40 fish day back then. And uh, it was just cut off jeans and tennis shoes. But strict, strict lessons from my grandfather. Very much like the opening part of A River Runs Through It. Practicing in the yard, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, learning our knots. Um, we really didn't even fish the Blackfoot until our third year of fly casting. We had to learn how to cast, do the knots, before we actually went to the river with flies. And so, you know, that was pretty neat. My other grandparents on my father's side um, lived on a lake. And so there I had bass, crappie, perch, catfish, did all that. And uh, just between the two, it's kind of why I think I'm a pretty well-rounded angler. I fish all tackle. I don't like really fishing with bait, but I do fish like bass fishing with traditional lures and things is really fun and really challenging. 
Um, I do some salmon and steelhead fishing with gear. So that background of fishing with my various grandparents, yeah, made me the the loser I am today. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. I would literally not call you a loser. I think anyone who listens to this, I mean, you have such amazing stories. I mean, for me, just listening to how it was back in the day and and how it is now, like, how do you feel about fishing now? Because, I mean, I think that the sport – you know, do you think it's still as authentic as it was back then to now? Oh, not nearly. Uh, yeah, I won't go on a big rant, but I'm not real impressed with, with fly fishing today. Um, thanks to Instagram and Facebook, I'm sure Instagram and Facebook will kill more fish than any dam ever built. Um, I just don't like all that glorification, the see me, the Insta famous, um, put posting pictures to get free gear. Um, and people say, well, what about all your pictures? Well, yeah, I was on an assignment. I was on a job. I had to. I didn't just go out there and see me all the time. I had a, a different I had a client. I had uh, people that needed the fish pitcher product. But to just be uh, posting every day of every fish you catch, I think, is uh, it's kind of icky. I just don't really like yeah. it too much. Uh, I still fish a lot by myself, and I just enjoy that feel that sense of uh just one against nature you know figuring out the hatch uh, taking your time i do a lot of observation you know i'm not just uh i'm I'm way past racking up numbers Uh, i think i like to be successful i mean especially if you're steelheading or you know mouse fishing rainbows in alaska yeah you want some action you know that's fun that's what you, you you went there to do but just on my local streams i have some very technical fishing light tippet, super small flies. And so I fish really slow and I'll change flies and experiment and make it more of a science project than anything else. I mean, I agree. It's so hard to try and see what's actually being genuine on Instagram or Facebook. And it's hard because it's like, you know, where are people genuinely wanting to do something to be to be there, to be in the moment, kind of like yeah. how you have lived your entire life to grab your camera, but to genuinely be there, not to grab a photo, not to be there to catch it, but to actually experience it. And I, it's hard to be like, are people genuinely experience experiencing what they're doing or are they there for a result? Right. And if you start taking away those experiences, I'm sure for you who've like dedicated their life to experiencing life, that, that must be a weird thing to see that people are, are kind of, taking that experience away. Yeah, it is weird. It would really, you know, my grandfather would roll over his grave. He was, you know, a traditionalist back in the 60s and 70s when fly fishing was becoming a little more popular. More fly fishing clubs were, you know, being started. And it was still, you know, you could still fish nearly any river and and drive a, a mile past someone because they had that water. Uh, my grandfather would drive five miles past someone because they have that water. And now when you see people 50 feet away, Euro nymphing it to death, it's just, uh, we're loving it to death too, you know? So I'm not not sure, uh, you know, I don't know if I'd want to be just getting into fly fishing now and never had experienced, you know, a three day float trip and just seeing one or two people or, you know, a, boat ramps in montana with no or one or two cars Um, that was pretty neat i have to say but i'm not a curmudgeon old fart that's going to just live in the past (laughs) i I still prefer you know i really prefer i think i like public water you know let's call it you know the henry's fork and the beaverhead the deschutes the metolius some of my favorite spots um it's easy to look on instagram at of someone holding a big Bolivian golden Dorado, oh, you know, some third world country with no pressure. You know, those fish are easy to catch. Um, golden Dorado are very easy to catch. And Alaska and Kamchatka rainbows on mice, it's one of my favorite fishing, but they're fairly easy to catch. But public water that's pressured um, sort of separates, you know, the strata of abilities, you know, and so when there's rising fish on some of the streams I just mentioned, you know what? They're not going to take any fly. They're not going to take a fly with bad presentation or oversized tippet 
or it's floating on its side or upside down, or if it's an emerger that's too big. So I enjoy fishing public water, even pressured water, whether it's Colorado, Montana, California, or anywhere here in Oregon, because you know what? You really got to fish well, and, and you got to make good decisions about the insects you're imitating, the presentation, and, that's, and I like that. I, I, I yeah. would never turn down another trip to Brazil for peacock bass or, you know, tarpon in Africa or something, but those fish are, you know, you work for them, but they're not that hard to catch. And, and so that's the thing on Instagram where I, I sort of really backed off because, you know, I was traveling a lot before COVID and doing a lot of different magazine assignments and things. And, you know, I'd post some pictures of these, you know, third world countries and big fish. And then I went into a little period of not traveling as much and doing a little bit different work because I did Catch Magazine for a while. And then I did a little, little work for the Fly Shop in Reading. And then now I'm with Eleven Angling. But I backed off on the travel a little bit. But I still kept seeing, you know, these pictures from people who host trips and there's giant Atlantic salmon and giant fish. And then I sort of thought, geez, I wonder if I, by posting those pictures I did, I wonder if there was people who were you know, like a lot of my friends, they're, you know, they're family people. They've got kids in high school or college. And they're, they're working hard, spending all their money on their kids or they're buying their car and their house. And, and maybe these really beautiful fish from exotic locations, maybe, maybe they just kind of looked at that as like, you know, only the privileged can do that. And I'm definitely not privileged. I just have opportunities because of association with magazines, websites, and things where I get to travel. Yeah. So I, don't, I, don't, I don't, always wonder if some of those posts I did might have even sort of hurt people's feelings or made them feel like, gosh, I'm, I like that fish, but I'll never be able to go there. And so I, I really backed off on publishing or posting photos um, that weren't for the everyday common person. Now, if I post anything, it's either something I do because it's work related and it's part of my job, or I prefer humor. You know, there's a lot of corny pictures on the social media. I, I'm a <laughs> gardener, you know, so I got a garden to die for, and fruit trees. And, and so <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty tempted to show off my tomatoes every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I also think, though, it could also help because, you know, someone who didn't come in a privileged spot, I think it also is a great way, though, for people to be like, wow, he pulled that off. I need to go out. Like, maybe I need to reevaluate what I really want to look forward to doing. Yeah. Because your photos are beautiful. Thank you. I mean, go to go to uh, Brian, com. Isn't that the website? Uh, BrianO'KeefePhotography.com. And I have to yep. say, Lauren, I, I made that website and I am not a web designer. I just picked some pictures and threw them up there. But it's very homey. And it's like your photos of your adventures. I mean, is there a place that you haven't been to that is on your bucket list of places you know, to go? That's a great question because I don't have that much of a bucket list. I, um, that's incredible. I mean, that is seriously so incredible to say that, that you get to say, I don't have anything left on my bucket list. Uh, it, I mean, there are still things I haven't done. You know, Manitoba has those giant brook trout that I read about when I was a kid in Outdoor Life magazine. And I, I, I think that would be fun to do. Really big brook trout would be cool. Also, you know, Greenland has some Atlantic salmon and some Arctic char that are huge. That would be pretty cool to see. I've flown over Greenland and it's, it's really not green. It's all white, but it's <laughs> green around the edge. And uh, some of those rivers are probably really amazing. But, you know, I'm Irish. I've never been to Ireland. I've never been to Scotland. What? Oh, yeah, I know. So, and... O'Keefe, come on, O'Keefe. That is on my bucket list. In fact, there's a fishing guide in Ireland named Brian O'Keefe. And we used to get, in the early days of email, I would get his email or people. <laughs> and and then we connected. I tracked him down. I said, you know, we, we need to go fishing together. <laughs> and that would be a blast. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, so before we even end this, you said you had a rattlesnake story, and I'm seriously dying to hear this story. Well, you know, if you fish the Deschutes, you're going to encounter a rattlesnake not just once in a while, but fairly often if you crash the brush, because again, you can't fish from a boat, you have to fish from weight only, and so you're up and down the sides of the river constantly. It's just a matter of time. 
and uh, there's these little rock, like boulder sized rocks with tufts of grass growing on the top and I just sort of jumped out to one as I was sort of planning on where I was going to enter this particular piece of water and I was just immediately nailed by a rattlesnake but it didn't even it didn't even have time to really to rattle and it wasn't very big and it didn't get me it got my waders and uh, so I jumped in the water and you know you're probably airborne three or four seconds because it's a rattlesnake and in the water and I walked kind of backwards to get away from this tuft of grass and that snake came flying out of there. And, you know, they can swim really fast. It's swimming right at me, head out of the water, hissing and sort of air striking coming at me. And I put my rod under its belly and I kind of flip him out of here like, can I get out of here? And the thing comes back and it keeps coming back. So I wade out farther thinking, well, the water's pretty cold snake will get cold it'll stop doing this or won't be able to do this because it'll get too cold but it just kept coming back and i flipped it away about four times i kept backing up making it farther to swim and it wouldn't take no for an answer and so i was getting like where i couldn't wade any deeper and uh i did one more flip under his belly and he came back and i reversed my rod and I had the reel in front and I turned the handle up and I grabbed the butt of the rod when it came within range I just whacked it as hard as I could in the head with the flat side of my fly reel and it curled up in a ball with its mouth wide open and just sunk and drifted away and I thought geez I mean I'm not a snake killer I I, I just won't <laughs> kill him but that one I was just one of the, my wits end, you know, and so on the Deschutes, there's this uh, rafting element there, not like our regular, you know, 14 foot rafts or pontoons. These local guys will get about 15 huge truck inner tubes and lash them all together. And they're really big. They're almost like tractor sized. And then they'll put plywood on top of all those inner tubes and secure them. And then they'll have a sofa. They always have a flagpole with a pirate flag. There's a keg of beer, and it's a party. They're not fishing. They're not even really whitewater enthusiasts or anything. They're just locals. They're more like bikers that like to go down the river and drink a lot. And so while I was slapping my reel on this snake's head and watching it drift by, I hadn't noticed that out in the river, one of these big inner tube contraptions was coming by with about eight people on it I mean, it's a giant like patio party patio floating by and they don't steer them you know they just bounce off things and there they go <laughs> and so i turned around and they weren't very far behind me and there's this one guy like the head pirate he's looking at me. i go did you just see that and he goes what i go i just killed a rattlesnake with my reel and he looks at me shakes his head and he goes i thought we were blanked up <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't believe me of course but yeah that was the story of being struck by a rattlesnake fending it off and then having to whack it on the head oh my gosh brian my cheeks are hurting so bad you are such a great storyteller i can tell why everyone tries to find you at the trade shows and have a drink <laughs> hear your stories because it's incredible first off yeah i i would kill a rattlesnake if it attacks me like four or five times hence i just probably attack it if it just tried to hiss at me once but man oh that is seriously one of the best fly fishing stories i've ever heard <laughs> So if anyone is interested in wanting to reach out with, out to you, want to hear some more stories, or maybe want um, to see some more of your photos, what's the best method of them getting a hold of you? Well, that's great. I um, One thing I really like to do is I do presentations at fly clubs and other you know conservation and fundraising events. And so if anyone wants to see you know an hour of my photography, I guess, then they can reach me <laughs> probably through my website, brianokeefephotography.com. There's contact information there. And uh, I don't answer my phone, you know, so if someone calls me, leave a message. I got too many <laughs> bill collectors. And uh, other than that, you know, 
I generally fish alone. People say, hey, Brian, I'd like to come out there and fish with you. I kind of go, um, hmm, hmm, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a hardcore fly fishing girlfriend, and in my spare time, I fish with her, and she'll be out till dark fishing in the cold. You know how the last cast can let, take yeah. 30 minutes? That's that's how she fishes. So we fish wow. when I have time uh, to fish with her. Otherwise, I fish by myself and a few buddies that I like to fish with, but I don't, I don't take people fishing. I don't guide, but I'm always available for... You know, like I said, you know, doing a fly club presentation or a conservation fundraiser. and Well, I'll be sure to keep my eyes open for that. And um, I'd say let's go fishing together, but uh, I'll keep my eyes open on any updates of photography. I just want to say thank you so much. This was probably the best hour of my day talking with you today. And um, thank you so much for joining me today. It's absolutely my pleasure. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns, and if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at thefebruaryroom.com. The February Room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.